Oh, shalom, my friends. Shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am excited and delighted to be about to talk to a conductor, a composer, an orchestrator, who obviously knows how to conduct himself. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a little bit about our guest in the neighborhood, Larry Blank. He is a three-time Tony Award nominee, a six-time Drama Desk nominee for his orchestrations for such Broadway productions as The Drowsy Chaperone and The Producers. He's a recurring conductor for places like, the, well, for the Pasadena Symphony, and he is conducted for the New York Philharmonic and the Auckland Symphony and the LA Philharmonic and the Boston Pops, and he has been behind the podium for everyone from Bernadette Peters to Randy Newman to Placido Domingo. So ladies and gentlemen, won't you please also welcome the author of the brand new memoir called I Was Playing Their Song. His name, wait, hold it, oh, uh oh, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> I'm drawing Larry Blank. Welcome to the neighborhood, Shalom. Thank you, Shalom. How are Happy you doing? to be here. How are you doing? Good to be here. How are you doing this fine Shabbos? It's fabulous. You know, I'm on an opposite coast, so it's a little bit earlier. Can you hear me all right? I hear you perfectly fine. You, you, fi you sound great. You look great. And so, so, so what are you doing? Uh, do you live in California or what's, uh, why are you all the way there? I live in California. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in Granada Hills. So it's, uh, it's 630 in the morning here. I, well, so, you, you, you look fabulous. So you, you're on your fifth cup of coffee, I hope, to keep you. But here's the deal. I mean, is it because you do work for TV and scoring stuff? Why wouldn't you be in New York? where the theater and the, the real arts action is well i came here a long time ago so i could do movies and i ended up doing theater on the west coast instead of the east coast and of course they keep on bringing me back and i keep working in london as well so i travel everywhere and i'm you know i originally grew up in bayside not far from great neck oh my god bayside queens shalom to you hello yeah. Dude, tell us a wonderful or not a wonderful memory of growing up in Bayside, Queens. When I moved to Bayside, Queens, when I was four years old. Wow. We, you, how did you carry the suitcases? I, I know it was just terrible. It was very tough. But I was, we, we were uh, right by the Clearview Expressway, the Throgs Neck Bridge, which wasn't built yet. Oh, all right. It was a tadpole bridge before it turned into a whole frog. Yes. It, it was a golf course, and we were the only house on the golf course. Ooh. No, wow. Nobody lived there, just us. And then, in short order, it turned into what it is today. Was that sad? I mean, did you love having that kind of rural life in the middle of New York? Or was it kind of more exciting when suddenly there was traffic and people and stuff? And ugh? Well, I, I didn't know any other way. I thought it was supposed to be rural. So it was all vacant lots and, and nothing. And it was, uh, it was like growing up. It was like being in California. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. So, Except, how, oh, please, yes. No, it's just colder. That's all. How Jewish was your family? How Jewish was my, let's put it this way. In our neighborhood, on Corporal Kennedy Street in Bayside, uh, th there were Christmas lights on one house, and my mother went, Oi. There, <laughs> goes, the and there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> and it was one house out of, you know, 400. <laughs> <laughs> But were you culturally Jew or also Jewy Jewish, like uh, the holidays and stuff? The holidays, but but uh, you know we we would go to the Bayside Jewish Center on an occasional Shabbos. Fair enough, fair enough. So, in your adult life, are you one of these Jews who's spiritual, or do you still identify as Jewish or Jew-esque? Well, my kids, who are only half Jewish, identify as Jewish. Mm. So let's put it that way. Uh, yes, I always identified as Jewish, but it was cultural more than religious. Can I ask, when did you meet your shiksa? <laughs> well, we've been married for 35 years. So, yes, yes. No, but was she an artist? Is she in the, the music field? Is she in the, what did she do? What? She was a dancer. She, she was a sugar baby. We met on sugar babies. Oh, my like, this was that Mickey Rooney in there at that point? Or, and then, oh, um, do you have, come, please tell me the, the Hagaby stories. Yeah, uh, well, tell me. 
well, I'll tell you, when I, I took over the show as conductor, it had been running for a while, and I went in. And when I was learning the show, Mickey was on vacation. And I learned the show with uh, Eddie Bracken and Ann Miller. And then my first night conducting the show, Mickey was on. And I I met him before the show. He, I walked into the pit. He walked onto the stage. He looked at me in the pit, and he said, with alacrity. With alacrity. That was his thing, with alacrity. Oh, but but he he cra- you told him, hey, look, uh, this is my first time with you, so you can't expect that that we have the symbiotic relationship that... But you built one with him, I assume. Was, was he okay? Was he a nice guy? I liked him. He, he couldn't have cared less. He was going to do that show regardless of me, the orchestra, Ann Miller, or anybody else. And that's the way he was. But not in a bad way. That's just Mickey Rooney. And he got on stage and he was fantastic. He was hysterical. And if if the audience didn't respond, he would look at me in the pit and say, it's a painting. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> How was Ann Miller? How was she, she was delightful. She was... She was the great. She was. She was very secretly funny. Ooh, exactly. And, yeah. I'll give you an example. We were doing the show for quite a while, and we were in Boston at the same time as La Cage Folle was trying out. So we were invited to go see La Cage Folle, and she was my date for the evening. We were watching the show, and it was a big, big success. And there's a big can can number in the show, and the entire audience was on its feet in boston it was just big hit and she was just sitting there and i said annie you know aren't you gonna you know stand up and she said i saw the original and i said you mean the the cold porter musical can can she said no no i saw it with toulouse (laughs) that was that was Annie Miller. This is like, like very very cute we are talking by the way with larry blank I, I would love to because i mean you've done composing you've done all this stuff, but, but conducting because you've been in the pit thousands of times it's funny to hear the funny stories and the horror stories do you have things like like i was in the pit when uh yeah lots of things happened uh you know for instance scenery crashing on stage which show what happened when do you remember what the a lot of shows uh <laughs> <laughs> happens all the time but i remember specifically uh uh they're playing our song which was my big first big broadway show from the beginning you know marvin hamlish neil simon and all those people and robert klein Lucy robert Nett. klein who has been on this program yay thank you yes great guy and uh that show most people don't know this but they're playing our song was the first automated scenery on oh. a broadway musical and because in the old days, they used to have stagehands in the wings turning cranks and stuff. And this had two concentric turntables, and it was the first time it was done automatically. I imagine there were a few problems. <laughs> Opening night in Los Angeles at the Amundsen Theater, the set didn't turn. And Robert Klein was in a, a little automobile upstage that took uh, about 25 minutes to come to the front of the stage. Oh dear! Oh, dear. and by the way, I should mention Lucy Arnaz, who is all, is also a friend of the day, but she has also been on this program, and she was absolutely delightful, She's well, great. Uh, lovely lady. So, so that, that's and what other stories of things smashing, crashing, booming, banging, and you ever see anybody literally get hit by a piece of scenery? No, we've been I've been lucky that way, but a lot of shows have had issues, you know, like Sweeney Todd, the whole rail collapsed and just missed Angela Lansbury, stuff like that. Whoa, I did not ever hear. I did. Wow. And that would have been serious. Yeah, that would have been catastrophic. This is true. And uh, things like I, I've actually been conducting and I hear a crash and you see a piece of, you know, uh, usually a flat piece just fell straight down to the stage and, you know, missed people. Who, who makes the decision at that point to stop or keep going? Do you keep playing or do you just say, you know, to the orchestra and, and what it, it wouldn't be my call unless it interfered or if i saw something happen if somebody was hurt i would have stopped instantly and, and just taken responsibility but the stage manager usually in the wings can make the call really quickly and uh but obviously in in a live situation like that i would stop <laughs> you in in modern show it seems to be a new thing but it's not of audiences being insane 
and and some crazy person coming up and yelling at the cast or, or have you have you had instances whether it's in Broadway or conducting um, in concert thing, where somebody in the audience does something mishuga or God forbid has a heart attack and dies and these happen too. What, what well, have you experienced? Yeah. One of my one of my favorites. I was conducting Phantom of the Opera at the Amundsen here in L.A. with Michael Crawford, and he's about to do Music of the Night, you know, the big the big number. And all of a sudden, I hear a phone ring, a cell phone ring. Now, this, you know, this was 1980. Who? Okay, yeah. It was 1989, 90. So there were cell phones, but they were, you know, they were like this. <laughs> it was a brick. And I, I heard it ring, and it was in the first row. And I turned my head. I thought Michael, who was a good guy, but if he were distracted, he would have stopped the show. And uh, it would take a lot, but he would have stopped it. And there's a lady in the first row, and she's got her phone. She says, I'm at the Phantom. Look. <laughs> Listen. Yeah. Camera on it. And Michael thought it was funny, so he started laughing. That's yeah, otherwise, it could have been a disaster. But she was actually holding her phone up saying, Listen to this. That's... Wow. And the people. And also, I've been in the pit where in the old days, before before cell phones, the musicians had beepers. And I always thought it strange that a bassoon player would have a beeper like it's an emergency. It could be another instrument. So so this bassoonist has a, has a beeper and... And, you know, it's Los Angeles, so the musicians are very busy in the studios doing films and stuff. I said, but a beeper in the pit? You know, you couldn't leave it in your locker? And it's going off in the pit while conducting the show. You know, it's like an emergency call for the bassoon. Oh, it was emergency. I mean, because you just, a thousand times you don't forget. The one time it's in your pocket, you forget to turn off. And if there's, a, if there's you know, 40 or 30 musicians in the pit, or 1,200 people in an audience, it's likely that one of those people one right. time will will make that annoy everybody this is this is the way it is. let me ask i i want to ask about some of your credits on the internet broadway database because for a couple of shows you are quote unquote uncredited orchestrations and yet they know you did them because you're listening on IBD. So who makes that that call why don't you get a little something in the playbill or like you know with larry blank and as opposed to, oh, no, shh, 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 you know, he's a exit. What, that, what, what is that? Well, in the old days, I'm talking about Broadway in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and stuff like that. Uh, whoever was credited as the orchestrator, there were four other guys helping out. It, it, there's always too much work. You can't really turn it out in the very short time that it's required. Because what happens, you go into rehearsals on a musical you got four to five weeks before the first orchestra rehearsal and they can't give you any music until about the third week when it's staged so basically you got two weeks to orchestrate an entire broadway musical which is approximately four thousand measures of music right. so so whoever's hired has a couple of pals ready on the side to help them out a few people could do it but you know, it's a test. And the only reason you do it is because you need the money because you get paid by the page. But very often over the years, there were many people doing this work without credit because they were called ghosts. Everybody involved with the show knew they were working on it. Maybe. Because we do our writing at home, you know, in the secrecy of our offices. Uh, but very often they were known people. And what happened is I would get a call uh, as a ghost. Sometimes it would credit, sometimes without, but what would happen is, for instance, the producers, uh, Doug Besterman- You were credit on that, weren't you? Or... I, was, I was not. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, everybody knew I did it, so it eventually leaked out into the IBD and you know IBDB and all, all those things, but I was not credited. But, I was called by Doug Besterman, who was the orchestrator on the show. And he said, I need some help. Can you come in? Everybody knows you're coming. 
So even before he asks you, it's like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's coming. Well, that's he, he cleared it with everybody. Oh, oh well, yeah. and to make sure it was okay to call me as opposed to any number of other people. And uh, I ha was flown from Los Angeles to New York. I came into the rehearsals. I was introduced. Wait, wait I'm sorry. When did it been in Chicago? Well, it, it opened in Chicago, but they were rehearsing. In oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was flown into New York. I was brought into rehearsals. Uh, I knew a lot of the people involved, uh, and I was introduced to the cast as helping Doug to finish the show. Hi. I had no contract with either the management or anybody else. I had only been called by Doug. So it was like a handshake? I mean, you obviously, I assume you were paid, I, or maybe I, in kind or something that, that you used. I was paid all of the correct amounts of money, all the, uh, I wasn't in the royalty pool or anything like that, but I was paid the, the page rate for doing the work that he was getting. Uh, and uh, if there were any after things like the recording or something, I would get paid, but uh, it, it wasn't my place to actually negotiate something. And I have to say, I expected that I was going to be given credit. But I, you know, I was a little too trusting that way because, and it wasn't mean spirit or anything. They're busy in rehearsals, and I should have perhaps stepped forward because then I would have shared the Tony Award and everything else, which I did not get any credit for. But eventually, the world knows because it's a, a, it's on the the page and it's part of your credits when you on your website and when you go. Yes, I am curious about this, but I guess it is the helper thing, like. When you have a show out of town and the, the producer to the, uh, the second act is, we need a song. We need a song for the lead actress. Then we need the 11 o'clock number, whatever the hell it is. We, or we need comedy tonight. We need something to start the show because Love is in the Air isn't working, whatever. So, you know, Sondheim or whoever goes to the piano at, you know, after the, the night show, <laughs> 11.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. It's like, I have a song. We want to put it in the show. And, and you say, okay, so we'll put it in the next night. Everybody can learn it. And so you got the actors sitting around the piano and then learning it so they can put it. But how the hell do you get a song with an orchestra behind it within, what, 15 hours? How well, does that happen? What happens, those of us who, who have trained to be orchestrators on Broadway, uh, that's the story. The deadline comes, you get the job at midnight, it's got to be ready by the morning. And, and it, it became almost like a badge of honor to be able to do it that quickly. And it's the same thing in the film world, by the way. Uh, I mean, I just don't, <clears throat> to, even to first to conceive of what a song should sound like with you know where the piccolos go and and when you should bring in the horns and what, but then to write it out for each instrument which how many instruments i mean you have to literally write four well it was in the old days it was 26 musicians in the pit so you have to write 26 and of course we didn't have computer programs like we have now so we were writing by and hand. then having them printed and then having you know the xerox or however they were they were thrown in there you have a scribe, you know, the copyists who also have to copy what you wrote into orchestra parts by hand and then reproduce. So it was a whole crew of people. And if you have, let's say, what, three, I don't know how many violinists you have in a pit, like two or three or what? Well, usually in those days, like six violins. So, would they all at least get the same part or would three violins be this and then three would be in counterpoint or harmony or something? Or generally you could give them the same thing six times yeah, or not six violins usually two parts maybe three parts so you know you're writing two-part harmony so you have to write all this stuff out and it gets gets ah you just made me think of a story please okay. i was uh working on a show called copperfield about it was the dickens copperfield yeah 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 and it was the score was written by kasha and hirshhorn who wrote pete's dragon and uh some things like that. The orchestrator was Erwin Costell. Erwin Costell did West Side Story with Sid Raymond and Bernstein. He did the movie of Sound of Music. He did the movie of Mary Poppins. Many, many Broadway shows. And if 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 you're old enough to remember the old Gary Moore show, 
Can I'm not, not quite, almost. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah. And they had a thing every week called Those Wonderful Years. And he did all of these big medleys. And then he did the Carol Burnett show. Anyway. Oh, Costal is the guy's name. Costal. And he was very well known for being exceedingly fast. He could turn out this stuff overnight. So we were making a change in one of the numbers. We were cutting 100 bars of music and rewriting it. Now, it sounds easy, but when you cut it... No, it doesn't. <laughs> you cut the it does not sound easy at all, but okay, yeah. And make some new transitions and write basically a new arrangement so that it all fits together. So I called Irwin up and I said, we're rehearsing tonight. We have a show tonight. But this new arrangement is going in tomorrow night. He had it ready for tonight? He had it ready for then? Worse than that. Worse than that. I call up the music copies and said, he's going to do this arrangement for tomorrow. Uh, so it goes in tomorrow night. They said, great. Great. So I go to dinner. I'm in the pit conducting the show. All of a sudden, my drummer starts laughing. And I look over at him and he points down at the music and goes, and I looked down at the music, and the music has been cut. 100 bars cut, new, new arrangement. That night, yeah. It's in the parts, and the musicians have never seen it. They're just turning their pages. But worse, the cast on stage of 22 dancers and the principals are doing the old version of the show. Right. Well, how would that? Yes, I, I, I. So what happened was I'm conducting. The music ends. It just because we we're, the musicians are just playing it, and it goes bump bump bump, and they're dancing for another hundred bars on stage. <laughs> this, is, this is on Broadway. Yes, it's like the Deaf West production there. <laughs> and they're dancing, and I'm sitting there. I I must have had smoke, you know, you know, going out of my ears, and. There's nothing I can do. There's no nothing there. anybody can do. Nobody's wrong. It's just one of those things. And they're dancing. They get to the end of the number, bump, bump. And there's no applause because there's no orchestra. There's no nothing. The audience is terribly confused. And of course, I had the rest of the show to conduct. So I get to the end of the first act. And of course, I'm beside myself because, and Erwin, who was an old man at that point, and I was this you know, 28 year old kid in the pit is walking down the aisle and he's, you know, an old season pro. He's done millions of things. He has his hand up and he says, you know, if you hadn't shouted oh fuck into the microphones, it would have been okay. <laughs> <laughs> Had you, or was he joking? I did. Yeah. Yeah, well, oh, oh my God. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Is that story in, you're, well, no, you're just talking about it, but it, are stories like that in your book, which is called I Was Playing Their Song? It is, indeed. What was the impetus to play, to, you know, well, you always ask this question. It's like, at this time in your life, what gave you, like, I should write all this down and put it in the book. What, what was that moment when you said, it's time to do the memoir? Uh, last July, I had a big birthday. Mazel? 70? Uh, or what? Yeah, and, and I said, Wow. I said, I, everybody had always told, told me to write a book because I just had so many incidents like that, as we do in the course of a life, especially, you know, in show business and stuff. And they're, they're all moderately funny. And uh, I said, I'm going to do this for my kids. I'm going to write it all down. And I was blessed with a very good memory. And I just, just sat down one day and started typing everything. I just wrote everything down. And I did it in sequence. I just, you know, said, I'm going to start at the beginning when I graduated high school and just keep going. And I wrote it all down. And then once I had all of this down, I asked a few friends and my wife to look at it a little bit. And they would read a little bit and they say, well, you know, you really should get this organized. And I got an editor to help me clean it up a little bit, just in, in terms of syntax and things like that. And that's how it happened. And so from the time that you said, I'm going to write this all down to the time when you proofread it and it's a book, how long did the whole thing, the, the process take? My birthday was last July. 
my God. So you really, you're just, um, well, mazel tov. Mazel. Let me ask you, I want people to buy this book. So don't tell me your favorite all-time story in the book, but tell me like your second or third favorite. Oh, story. there's so many. All right. There's so many. Uh, but but uh, uh, I, I have so many. Oh, uh, I have a good. I have a a very good one. You'll you'll appreciate this. I have been conducting the Olivier Awards uh, for the last twelve years or so in London. Uh, I have no business conducting the Olivier, Olivier Awards because I'm an American. I'm a Yank. But what happened was the Olivier Awards, which are like the Tony Awards. Yeah. Uh, in London were often done in a ballroom and it was uh, a dinner and uh, they would they had a band they would say the winner is Diana Rigg for Medea and the orchestra would play on a wonderful day like today (laughs) (laughs) what to do with your kids today right yeah right (laughs) it was it was that silly where they'd say the winner is boom, the timpanist, you know, it was a timpani role. So it was, it was very, the Brits are very smart, but they didn't get the award show thing. It's not their style. So one of the producers, uh, an American producer who works in London named Kim Poster told the society of London theaters that I was the perfect guy who worked in both countries that could, help them put it together so i changed the character more like the tonys and into uh um the oscars so we played music that was appropriate for the performers if someone won for medea we did not play on a wonderful day like today what we do you play for medea so well, what, I, I, what I, I did uh, is i wrote a theme for the oh, olivia. Gosh, uh, yeah, yeah. so you play the olivia theme ta-da, ta-da, you know and let it, me ask you it's a uh, especially for the Olympiades, what is their process of like, you get an actor up there and it's this big moment for them and they start to take this big thank you to this and thank you and God and this, and then they go and they go. Is it, how do you make that judgment? I guess it's your call when you start to go like, yeah. They actually have a light system and they have this at the Academy Awards too. They have three lights and after I think 40 seconds or 60 seconds yeah depending on the the unless it's a legend and yes, then it's 90, that, that yeah. no lights yeah and the light comes on and then the second light and then the red light which means we're going to play you off so what happens is i took the onus off me all everybody is informed that when the red light hits the conductor is going to play you off period and only once was i yelled at where i started to play a famous director off and he turned around and said stop that who can you say who it was because it's not i i probably would do that too it's, it's nothing personal against you it's like come on i'm saying so this is my moment I, you can give me 15 more seconds which you really can't because you're on tv yeah. but who who was it who was the it? director was sam mendez who's a very yeah i've heard of him i mean yeah, uh, and fellow jew so there you yes. go yes. and and he didn't mean anything by it and of course no. i'm not going to argue i just stop did you but, really oh yeah i just cut the orchestra off because otherwise uh i'm the jerk you know if i keep going wow so, and how much longer did, did he did he realize he did have to wrap it up at some point i mean did he he go on for 10 seconds or did he go on for another minute and a half he went on for another three minutes so, no really yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's i'm sorry that's a little selfish that's a little thoughtless you it know? was and that's how you know it's it, some now the rule is by the way if someone is talking about their recently deceased partner or parent you can't cut them off if they're talking about uh, how they just escaped from kiev you can't cut them off you, know? you can yes you, you, know. you got it so and sometimes I was given the cue to cut somebody off and it was somebody who I knew very well and I didn't cut them off. <laughs> Do you have any, any, any stories about actors behaving badly, especially if they're dead? You can, you can, oh, oh, who, oh, oh. who? Could well, be on stage or off stage or whatever, share. Uh, uh, well, I was going to tell you another story about the Olivier's. Oh, oh, please, no, either, either one. Well, I'll do this one first because I was on a roll. 
on the Olivier's, um, where the, the orchestra is on stage and it's the BBC concert orchestra. So it's like a 50 piece orchestra. It's not a little band. It's not a jazz band. It's an orchestra, proper orchestra, which is even better than the Tonys because they don't have that large an orchestra. And, and we can play wonderful things. So we are way upstage and they would have a drop in front of us usually. And, you know, where the action is down front and the drop would fly out and I'd be up there with the orchestra. We'd play a big production number. So we had a song, Michael Feinstein was uh, a guest artist and uh, we had Michael Ball, who is a rather big name in the UK was on the show and a few other people doing a big Broadway medley, finishing with Sondheim's old friends, hey, the chorus, oh, the orchestra. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So I was upstage and they were announcing this big medley and it's a television show. So I'm wearing a headset. I'm watching a TV monitor, bands in front of me with all the stand lights and microphones and about 30 seconds before the number starts, all the power goes off on stage. Nothing I, anybody can do, though, but what can you do? Yeah. Darkness. And they're talking. They don't know that the power has gone off on the bandstand. Oh. Because they're back there talking. So what's going to happen is this thing is going to fly out, and I'm going to be on stage with a dead orchestra because we have no lights or power and I can't see the TV monitor. So I am schwitzing. <laughs> Actually, the piano, piano player could still, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of a flashlight. You could kind of, you know, one violin. Like, but yeah. and, and I'm, I'm saying, how am I, what, what, are, there's no one I could communicate with. I can't run off the stage, you know? So I'm sitting there. What? am I going to do what am and the show's on it's on TV and I was just sitting there like this and I said in the dark <laughs> Covent Garden Opera House and it was going to fly and I was going to turn around and turn to the audience and say have you ever seen a Jew tap dance <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't get it because the lights went back on five seconds before or what happened Michael Feinstein was in the wings and he saw my predicament and he went running and they found the cable that had, the lights came on and there was so much sweat in my eyes, I couldn't see anyway. <laughs> so that's what happened. That, no, that's that's a pretty fantastic story. That, that we're talking with Larry Blank. We have um, Dave coming in in a moment to, to do the quiz with David Sheward is going to play and Leslie Hoban Blake will play the, the fun weekly trivia quiz. But I, 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 I got to, well, first of all, I have to remind everybody to get Larry Blank's book. It's called I Was Playing Their Song. You can find out more about it at his website, Larry Blank Music. Dot com, but you can also get the book on Amazon and Kindle and all the usual places that people sell books. So, so unfortunately, I don't have much more, but I have time for that one more question because you were you had a glint in your eye when I asked you about a, a rotter, a bestie on stage. Who who was like a ooh. oh someone bad on stage? Um, or well, yeah, there. I have to honestly say, of all the people I worked with, I never really. E even with people who are supposedly a terror, you know, well-known terrorists, actor terrorists, I've never had a problem. And uh, 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 only because I didn't, you know, it wasn't because I was a genius. It was just that I was always, I was never rattled. Muscle. This is know, great. So, so it was fun. I'm trying to think of someone who was really terrible and mean. And I can honestly say, the only things that really went bad on stage is if somebody forgot the words. Oh, yeah. Well, that, yeah. So I'll tell you a funny one. He wasn't bad, but I worked with Paul Sorvino a number of times. Yes. And he was, he was a lot of fun. He was quite a character. And the first time I worked with him was in 1989, somewhere it's like, it was, no, it was 1979, 1979, 80. And I did a big, gala in washington dc and he was hired to 
sing an original song okay about new york and we rehearsed it it was great oh he wrote he wrote the song original song by no, no, they, they hired somebody to write it oh it wasn't it was right a new song right that, and, yeah. and he came out on stage with me conducting the orchestra and did not remember one word not one and he was behind me and he went out and started and started singing vowels he just went <laughs> and it was just gibberish just total gibberish he remember the melody uh, maybe uh, and it was all over the place and because i was upstage i couldn't even make eye contact and he went through the whole song just gibberish and he walked off stage to a standing ovation <laughs> that's talent that they thought, yeah they thought I, it was italian i wish i wish we had time to talk about more of these people and, and to say now you have some lovely stuff in there about jack cassidy and that, that he was a real uh, a mention things like that but but you know what we'll save some of that maybe you'll come back to the neighborhood sometime but for now you're staying you're not going anywhere i have to get to shul i'm already late but dave lefkowitz the producer of dave's gone by he's waiting in the wings ready to play the today yes or to moderate the trivia quiz that we do every week so my friends shalom to you i am rabbi sal you'll see me very soon for now you're seeing larry blank in the neighborhood thank you larry and shalom to you